Uh, good evening, uh, honorable senators. Uh, first uh, off, I'd li just like to make quick introductions. Uh, Ray Massacott, to my right, is a staff sergeant with the Waterloo Regional Police and is also the full-time president of the uh, Waterloo uh, Regional Police Association as well as director of the Canadian Police Association. Uh, for myself, I am also an active uh, police officer with the Ottawa Police Service and I'm the, uh, presently the full-time president of the Canadian Police Association. Honorable Senator, bonsoir. L'Association Canadienne de Police. Good evening. The CPA has the great pleasure of uh, uh, providing a witness evidence uh, before uh, the Senatorial Committee uh, for illegal and constitutional affairs for B-15, which provides minimum sentences for serious drug crimes. The CPA is the national voice for 57,000 police personnel serving across Canada. Uh, through our 160 member associations, the CPA membership includes police personnel serving in police services from Canada's smallest towns and villages, as well as those working in our largest municipal cities, provincial police services, and members of the RCMP. The CPA is acknowledged as the national voice for police personnel in the reform of the Canadian criminal justice system. We are motivated by a strong desire to, one, enhance the safety and quality of life of the citizens in our communities, two, share the valuable experiences of those who are working on the front lines, and uh, three, promote public policies that reflect the needs and expectations of law-abiding Canadians. Our goal is to work with parliamentarians from all parties to bring about meaningful reforms to enhance the safety and security of all Canadians, including those sworn to protect our communities. Today, our members see the devastating effects that drug traffickers and producers have in all of our communities. Those police officers are the ones that constantly have to arrest the same drug dealers and producers over and over again and stop them from poisoning your children, our children, our grandchildren, and robbing youth of their future. Whether these criminal organizations are in larger urban centers like Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, Halifax, or in smaller communities like St. John, Gender, and yes, even Kujuak. Frontline police officers see on a daily basis how organized crimes supply dangerous and illegal drugs with not only disregard for the law, but having no consideration for the lives and families that they destroy. When I say dangerous, I say this because drugs that exist today are often even more dangerous than years past oftentimes laced with a variety of different chemicals to make them more potent. For a number of years, the Canadian Police Association has been advocating for a national drug strategy that incorporates a balanced approach to reduce the adverse effects associated with drug use by limiting both the supply of and demand for illicit drugs, enabling an integrated approach to education, prevention, treatment, and enforcement. In our view, this legislation is critically important in addressing the enforcement component of this strategy. Minimum sentences can, in fact, make a difference. Some officials and academics are often prone to argue against minimum sentences. They advocate greater discretion for the judiciary, alternatives to incarceration, and an emphasis on rehabilitation. Violent offenders are not deterred by our current sentencing, corrections, and parole policies. Chronic offenders understand the system and work it to their advantage. Criminal gangs have taken over prisons and have taken over some of our neighborhoods. We need stronger intervention, which combines general deterrence, specific deterrence, denunciation, and reform. Canada's experience with impaired driving legislation over the past three decades demonstrates that mandatory minimum sentences has had a deterrent effect both in general terms with respect to potential impaired drivers and in specific respect to regards to repeat offenders. 
Mandatory minimum sentences for serious drug crimes will help in our fight against organized crime in the trafficking and production of drugs. Whether it's by keeping dealers and producers off the streets and out of business, or by serving as a deterrent to potential dealers, C-15 will help our members in doing their jobs and keeping our communities safe. In simple terms, keep these criminals in jail longer and you take away their opportunity to traffic in drugs. Repeat offenders are, in fact, a serious problem. There has been considerable debate about the use of minimum sentences and the frequency of repeat offenders. Make no mistake about it, repeat offenders are a serious problem. Police understand this intuitively as we deal with these frequent flyers on a routine basis. Statistics released by the Toronto Police Homicide Squad for 2005 demonstrate this point. Among the 32 people facing murder or manslaughter charges for homicides in 2006, 14 of them were on bail at the time of the offense. 13 were on probation. 17 were subject to firearms prohibition orders. The revolving door justice system is failing to prevent further criminal activity by these repeat violent offenders. So what's Bill C-15 going to do? Well, here are actual scenarios that illustrate how provisions in C-15 are seen from a frontline police officer's perspective. La peine minimale d'emprisonnement d'un an pour la... One year mandatory prison a sentence for dealing drugs such as marijuana when carried out for organized crime purposes or when a weapon or violence is involved. Scenario one. With organized drug trafficking comes weapons in many cases. Recent investigations on mid-level drug traffickers who were arrested revealed that the mid-level drug dealers were being supplied weapons from the crime organization they belong to in order to assist them in their drug collection activities. As part of the warrants which were executed, weapons, drugs, and bull bulletproof vests were seized. Some individuals charged and convicted received limited jail time of less than two months. A Kitchener drug dealer moved to BC where he learned to grow marijuana. After his arrest in BC for operating a home grow operation, he returned to Kitchener and started a garden supply business where he set up a network of grow operations. While being investigated in Kitchener for his illegal operation, he returned to BC to plead guilty of production of marijuana and was placed on house arrest. He returned to Kitchener unmonitored, where he was once again arrested for production of marijuana. This person was responsible for introducing sophisticated grow operations to the region of Waterloo, which quickly spread from Ottawa to Windsor. This male's activities would have been thwarted had he been incarcerated. A two-year mandatory prison sentence for offense of running a large marijuana grow operation involving at least 500 plants. With health and safety aggravating factors, it goes up to a three-year mandatory prison sentence. So in case scenario number three, children are the victims of grow ops as well. One such incident in Kitchener where a marijuana grower was living in his grow house with his wife and two children. During the night, the house erupted in flames due to a defect in the illegal electrical bypass. The flames spread quickly due to the intricate ventilation system installed in the grow room. The male fled the house by himself, leaving his family inside. Neighbors noticed the flame arrived and rescued the woman and children from the inferno. Firefighters arrived on scene and extinguished the blaze. One firefighter described fighting this fire as trying to put out a fire in a high efficiency wood stove. The fire burned uncharacteristically, uncharac sorry for the French, uh, hot causing concern and danger <laughs> to neighbors and responding uh, emergency services workers.